Today, we're excited to kick off a new series of interviews with our management consulted coaches. We'll learn more about their background, journey to MBB, what they've been up to after the firm, and their case coaching philosophy. First on the hot seat is Yusuf Sheikh, an ex-BCG -er based out of South Africa. And stay tuned after the interview for our new segment, After Office Hours, where we answer your listener questions. Today we'll answer a listener question about generalist versus specialized consulting roles. I hope you enjoy the discussion. Yusuf, we're so delighted to have you with us today. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I'm uh, excited to be here today and share more with your listeners. Absolutely. Well, as one of our coaches here at Management Consulted, I'm sure that there's a lot of folks out there that'd like to learn a little bit more about who you are, your background, experience, your take on the case interview process. So let's dive in. Let's dive in with some personal questions to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, we'll start off with a random question. Yusuf, who is one person from history that you would love to get dinner with? Sure. Thanks so much for that question. So it's an interesting one, and I, I had a good think through it before uh, uh, answering it or deciding what my, my answer would be here. Um, and not to be too cliche, but it's actually a former Baini. Uh, his name is Hamilton Helmer, and he's an author of probably one of the best books in, in business strategy and you know just business as a whole, and it's called Seven Powers. Now, the reason I would, I'd want to have dinner with him is uh, for two reasons. One, he has an extremely interesting history about how he actually joined Bain Capital, or Bain, sorry. He uh, actually had a major or a PhD that was outside of business, and uh, he was interviewing to get into a management consulting firm. Uh, it piqued his interest for various reasons. And he actually interviewed directly with Bill Bain. Now, he was up against a whole lot of MBA candidates, um, and was really concerned that he wasn't coming from a uh, an Ivy League business school. So at the end of his interview, he um, he told Bill Bain, you know, I'm I'm worried about you know whether or not I get in, and I'm worried about you know not having an MBA. And Bill Bain's response was, well, neither do I. So uh, that, for me, that was that was an interesting one. And apart from that, he's written, you know, as I mentioned, the brilliant book Seven Powers, um, and it's really one of the best books that that takes you through a lot of the strategic. Um, elements that are important if, when you when you're helping build um, and advise a, a business that um, expects to exist into the future and uh, continues to endure. So, highly recommend that book as well. Oh, I love that. I'm not familiar with that book. I'm going to have to to take a look. Uh, and even more so, uh, it is interesting since since you are not an ex Bainey, right? You you are an ex BCGer, uh, and we'll we'll hear more about your pathway. To, to that firm a little bit later. But um, one other personal question I wanted to ask you, um, and I, I can hear a little bit of it in your voice. Uh, so the, the you've spent some time in South Africa. Would love to hear a little bit more about that and your favorite part of living there. Sure. So um, I'm actually 100% uh, uh, born and bred in South Africa. Uh, so I have a little bit of that, or I guess I have a lot of that South African <laughs> accent. You know, um, as you know, I'd hope most South Africans would probably say, even most of those who've, who've immigrated for, for various reasons, there's a lot to love about South Africa. So I guess I'd distill it into one, one element, and that's the, that's the people. Um, South Africa has a brilliant culture of coming together, especially in adversity. Um, and there's probably the best way to see this is whenever there's something crazy or terrible going on in our country, you can just log on to social media or Twitter, um, look at the trending hashtags and just see how South Africans just make absolute fun of the worst situations. Um, and, and that's really a function of, of the culture of coming together, you know, being supported irrespective of, of the history we've had in South Africa, um, coming through into democracy in, in the 90s that, you know, people love to come to, together in our country and um, that filters through to every part of life, whether it's work um, and, and different cultures coming together. You can imagine a BCG, especially where uh, you have South Africans, you have people from South, outside of South Africa, to, and you have case teams with people from different backgrounds all coming together and just enjoying a really great culture. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's the people that, uh, that make South Africa really special. Mm. 
Are you still located there? And what are you doing these days? Yeah, I am still in South Africa, so I've actually moved around. I uh, I was born um, and, and grew up on the eastern part of South Africa, close to the East Coast. Um, I then studied at university on the West Coast in Cape Town, at the University of Cape Town, and then moved up to BCG that was headquartered up in Johannesburg, the northern part of the country. I spent some time at BCG. I'm now actually uh, working with South Africa's leading fintech payments company uh, called Yoko, and I advise them on, on two key things. One is directly business strategy and corporate strategy. Uh, and second, linking to a different part of my career, which is um, corporate development and uh, M&A. So advising them on uh, the next big venture that, that we should go into um, within the country as well as beyond South Africa. Well, I'm excited to hear more about how you got there and the, the journey and the pathway that you've taken. Uh, so sure. let's take a couple of steps back. Uh, before you went to BCG, um, what's a quick introduction of your background pre-consulting? Sure. Sure. So um, I was fortunate to enter consulting straight out of university, but there were a few steps before that. Um, I majored in finance and accounting at university. I interned both at an auditing firm, and I was initially on the path to be towards becoming a chartered accountant, but uh, through an internship decided that that wasn't for me, and also uh, went through various programs for investment banking. Um, but once I was... Uh, once I learned more about consulting, realized that that would actually be my niche um, and was fortunate enough uh, to first intern at BCG. Um, and following that, I then received a full time offer to join the BCG Johannesburg office as a, as a junior associate. So you broke in as an intern. What can you extract some insights for for those looking at a similar pathway and wanting to break into a top firm? What can they do to set themselves apart? So there's, there's two important elements, and I, and I, I really underscore this when, when I run through candidate preparation interviews. Uh, the first is, and I, and I almost like to describe it this way, is that cracking the case is almost like just getting through the door, right? So that is almost, uh, and, and I guess the, the way talent is in the world um, and the competitiveness around getting into uh, top tier consulting firms like McKinsey, Bain and BCG is that cracking the case is really just the bare minimum. Um, mm -hmm. Really what gets you the job is, you know, a little bit that comes out of the case interview, but it's actually more around what happens around that case interview, some of the questions before and after. So step one is you have to crack the case and, and be really good at that. Um, and that's what manage, management consultant helps, um, helps mm -hmm. you do as a listener. The second part of it is how you're able to draw on personal experiences, um, especially if, if you're a grad who's, who's interviewing, but also um, past professional experiences if you're an experienced hire, mm -hmm. to show how you are able to approach problems in the world, whether it's business related or even maybe personal in nature. Mm -hmm. um, combine that thinking as, long as, as well as working with people, people to be able to um, solve a problem. And maybe I'll give an example. I'll give an example actually from um, someone that I, that I interviewed. So I always try to, to, to tell um, candidates that when you're interviewing, there needs to be something about you that when the partner at the firm concludes the interview, that he must be able to quickly remember you and be like, he's that guy. So for example, I was the, the FinTech app guy. Um, in my final interview with uh, a BCG partner, and he was actually from, from the Netherlands, uh, we probably spent the, the bare minimum. We spent about 15, 20 minutes on, on the case, and we actually spent a lot more time chatting about an idea that I had to build an app uh, to help uh, people in lower income segments, so your lower LSM groups, save money very easily. Um, and there's an idea that I had at university that you almost have this little wallet um, almost the same as getting scratch cards for airtime on your phone. You almost load up this wallet, and from there you can buy mm. really simple and easy to understand invest investments like um, retail government bonds as a way to make it to open up access to investments. And that's really what we chatted about. What was the problem? Um, and almost you know showing off a little bit of your structure through there. Mm. And I like to use the STAR framework. Mm -hmm. um, so so we end up chatting a lot about that, and I'd hope that by the end of that interview. 
um, that he'd remember that, you know, me as the, the app guy or the guy who, who thought about that. And fair enough, when I did get the, the internship offer and, you know, I asked for some feedback, um, I got, you know, constructive feedback. Um, and one of one of the items were he liked the, the innovation and that entrepreneurial flair that I brought. Um, but by way of example, with, with, with some candidates, um, I've, I've coached uh, a doctor uh, who told me a fantastic story about uh, some of the challenges he faced when um, helping a woman give birth. Um, another story is um, a former army vet. Um, so there's, there's different experiences that you can draw on um, and showcase that and find a way to incorporate that into, into an interview. The, part of that element, as well as maybe you don't have the, the most exciting story that you could share, but there's something that you can show off. And uh, it's sort of limited and unique to this time is that we've just gone through this or we are in some aspects going through this period of COVID. And COVID has disrupted businesses in many aspects. And a lot of the case interviews, especially if you take from case interview books, they're based on business as usual and how you'd usually crack uh, business problems under your usual circumstances. Mm. But with COVID, it actually introduces additional levels of complexity. And if you're smart about it in an interview, you actually can start bringing what you've experienced through COVID into that um, problem-solving process and showing off that skill. A simple example is um, if, you, if you're building out a problem, for example, you... you, you advising on whether to enter a new market um, and you produce, you know, your product in country X and you now want to export to country Y. An important consideration would be the incre increasing cost of shipping um, that's almost skyrocketed and gone, gone up tenfold since the start of the pandemic, which is a significant difference and a, you know, a significant incremental cost versus pre-COVID and something that isn't usually built into your typical consulting um, case books. So, yeah, in uh, I guess a little bit of a longer version. Set yourself apart through your your business uh, problem solving process. Absolutely, I, I love how you you talked through. There's no one perfect profile for for someone to get into these firms, um, and that it's not all. It's not only about the case interview itself. Um, now, you know, as someone who um, you know is from South Africa. Uh, recruited and worked in South Africa, but now has coached people from all over the world and worked at a global firm as BCG. Uh, what's your perspective on um, the, the, the nature of the interview process? And what I mean by that is, is it really different in South Africa versus Europe versus the US? Or um, it, is it pretty much the same process if you're interviewing for a global firm? So I'd say it's fundamentally the same process. And the reason why is, I guess, in South Africa, South Africa there's a little bit of a hack. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to interview with Bain, McKinsey, and BCG. Um, and most of the time, the people who interviewed me, actually, I'd say 90% of the time, um, people were not from South Africa. They were actually mm -hmm. consultants, principals, partners, from offices outside of South Africa, um, from as far as the East. So um, my uh, part of my two final round interviews, one of them was with a partner from Japan, um, you know, to Amsterdam and Netherlands, um, Ivory Coast, um, London. So I'm just thinking through some of the people that interviewed me, but really these people are from all over the world. But mm -hmm. um, the process fundamentally is the same. What I like to tell uh, tell people is that sometimes um, the specific consulting firm differs in where their niche areas are, mm -hmm. and sometimes the office itself specializes in a specific niche area. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, a Bain London office would be considered to be a specialist in the private equity industry. Um, so, you you might see that the people who might interview you there. Uh, would have a case more focused towards that specific industry. But, you know, at the end of the day, that really is uh, dependent on the specific consultant or partner. Um, and I'd say, yeah, the, the people generally like to, or the, the people who interview generally like to draw on their own consulting experience to build out a, a case interview for candidates. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Really appreciate your perspective on that. It, it, global firms use a global process, um, but you do have to dive in and understand the, the lines of business of that particular firm, the specialty areas of that office, et cetera. So 
Uh, that's great. Thank you for sharing your perspective there. Um, now let's let's look back and think about your time at BCG. Could you describe for our listeners what's a typical day in the life of of a consultant? Sure. So um, I I was at BCG pre pandemic, so this mm-hmm. might have changed a little bit. But I I do keep up with a few colleagues, and I think from a uh, meeting standpoint, it's probably a little bit different. But um, a typical li- uh, you know day in the life of consultant usually starts out with um, a daily stand up uh, early in the morning um, with your case team, usually at the client site. Mm-hmm. This is where uh, consultants as well as client counterparts um, from various different work streams come together to discuss. Uh, usually, it's you know progress made from the previous day. Um, action items or prioritize, prioritize priorities for today or the week going forward, mm-hmm. um, and any roadblocks or um, issues that any one work stream or one consultant might have that they might need support in from someone else. And usually, you discuss things that are that are on pause or on hold for now. Um, you then proceed into um, what are usually you know working side by side with the client counterpart. Um, and this involves various things, um, things like, you know, working side by side to pull data. So sometimes it's data collection, sometimes it's data analysis. Sometimes you've prepared work from the previous day and you're validating this with, with the client counterpart um, and running through various analysis and, and frameworks and that sort of thing to um, help gain the buy-in from your client through this uh, business problem solving mm-hmm. process. Mm-hmm. Um so it really is uh, gathering information from your client and using that very valuable time with your client, who is, who is the very important um, party in, in, in these cases, um, to build out a solution that will really be impactful and will, and will be lasting. You then usually take that information, uh, package it up, write up your notes, um, usually send summary emails for whatever calls that, you, that you've had. And that's usually a big role of the consultants is making sure that you're very detail orientated when um, asking the right questions and trying to get to the right answers uh, and packaging it up in a, in a way that's easy to understand. You then, um, around the end of the day, around 4 or 5 p.m., um, pack up and then head over back to the office in, if you're working in the same city as the office or back to your hotel. Um, you then usually break for dinner um, and then meet up again um, after dinner to discuss uh, outcomes from some of the calls earlier in the day, um, some of the emails or the or the data that you've packaged, um, and discuss some of the the next steps. Um, this would usually involve some deliverables, which may be due that evening. So um, consultants are known for working a little bit into the evening. Um, you know, case dependent. If you're able to to wrap up your day at the case a bit earlier in the day, then you head back a bit earlier to the office and finish up earlier. But sometimes. And, you know, most times it actually happens a bit late in the day. Mm. But yeah, that's when you, you, you package up some work, you usually share it um, internally. Uh, that evening it gets reviewed the next morning. And uh, you know, this is typical for a lot of managers. They, they usually like to have their mornings clear um, to, you know, get some uh, time to review your work, uh, pass in some comments. Usually this passes up the chain towards the partner and you sort of have to wait the next morning for the partner feedback. That, that information comes back to you the next day and you sort of package it and incorporate that into your next day of analysis and, um, and slide writing. Um, you know, a, a typical day and, the, you know, the, the accumulation of days re- usually culminates into um, a few key steering committee meetings. And this is mm-hmm. usually the, the peak of your consulting cases when you all your, your, your consulting um, uh, insights are now packaged. Um, it's now presented to a key group of people, usually um, from the consultant side as well as the client side. And, and, and that's the big day where, where you either hear the go ahead and, you know, full alignment or back to the drawing board. Um, sometimes it's dependent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, there, there's always something else coming. Right. And that project yeah. cycle, once you've done it a few times, you can you can get the sense of the, the way that it ebbs and flows over time. But um, in, in what you just talked through, I heard a lot of, you know, a, a lot of collaboration across the team, a lot of uh, ever changing work, dynamic days, some some long days. Uh, yep. So, yep. Thank you for sharing about that from your perspective at BCG. Uh, now let's think about uh, what made you leave the firm. Why did you decide that it was time to move on? 
What did you move on to? And how did your consulting skills help you succeed there? We'll be right back after this quick break. Have you ever heard a new digital trend and thought to yourself, okay, does this really matter? Asking the right questions helps you cut through the noise and get down to what matters most. I'm Jim Hertzfeld, host of the What If So What podcast, where we discover what's possible with digital and figure out how to make it real by asking what if, so what, and most importantly, now what? Subscribe and listen, and together we can turn big ideas into tangible actions so you can get shit done. We'll be right back after this quick message. Would you like to receive direct mentorship and prep support from a former McKinsey, Bain, or BCG consultant like the one you're hearing from today? Well, with Black Belt, our flagship consulting prep program, you can. In Black Belt, you receive eight or more one-on-one coaching sessions with the coach of your choosing. They'll work with you in a structured way to help you prepare for interviews and land that coveted consulting offer. In addition, you also receive lifetime access to the entirety of our digital consulting prep materials, including but not limited to nine courses, 500 plus practice cases with solutions, hundreds of practice drills, including mental math, structure drills, market sizing, four intensives, and much more. Plus, our support team will be on standby to answer your questions and provide guidance wherever needed along your journey. If you're tired of wasting time in your interview prep process, Black Belt is for you. Click the link in the show notes to learn more and to purchase today. Sure. So I was actually very fortunate to have uh, really good managers at at BCG. Um, And something that I really pride myself in is building networks around me. And I think that's probably one of the very important skill sets and opportunities that you have as a consultant is building a very strong network of highly skilled, um, you know, top achievers, people who are almost the best in their game, whether it's on the consultant side and you get specialists in specific domain areas or even specialists even in industry. So I, I, I built a really good network while at BCG and uh, very early on, um, uh, you know, I had managers who, who trusted me and believed in me and, and coached me through this. And towards the, the end of the year, actually, I was I was working through cases that, uh, you know, I I guess I wasn't necessarily enjoying. Um, I think consulting has its space for people in their career. Some people set specific targets for how long they want to stay in consulting. Some people want to be in consulting for life. They just love the, um, the elements that go into it. Um, but I always sort of had a timeline in mind. Um, and considered that, uh, you know, considering that I came from a background in finance, mm-hmm. um, really started become, becoming interested in the world of investing. Um, and that really peaked when I worked on a private equity due diligence. And post that case, um, I was discussing, you know, with my manager, you know, it would be awesome to be able to, to get into industry. Um, and it was an opportune time when um, his fellow uh, classmate from, from Duke, actually, um, had started a private equity firm a few years before and was actually hiring. Um, the, so, you know, my manager was a, was a BCG, uh, Duke MBA. Uh, his colleague was also a uh, Duke MBA, but a, a former Bainey. Um, but nevertheless, they, they still remain friends. Um, and, you know, he recommended, hey, uh, if you're keen to get into industry, maybe this is something you should just chat to my friend about. Might be something that you're keen on, maybe not now, maybe even in the future. Um, so I decided, you know, why not uh, keep to have the exploratory call and, you know, maybe it's something I can further sink my teeth into. Um, and from there, uh, it was actually, we, you know, I got on with my with my later bosses like a house on fire. We we, we both had this consulting skill set and this way of com- communicating. Um, but, you know, this prospective company and, and, and uh, future colleague, uh, would describe a very innovative model for private equity in Africa that I thought was fantastic because it leveraged um, almost a consulting-like framework um, and applied that along with some capital to small and growing businesses in Africa. And I thought, wow, this is fantastic. And if you remember back, I, I, I spoke a little bit about that entrepreneurial play and you know, getting onto the ground and getting operational and, and helping grow businesses. So... Uh, I very excitingly took that opportunity. It was a three-year program, um, and it was really, you know, part of the the fun the the firm's pilot fund to show that it could bring young people from consulting 
pair them up with entrepreneurs who have just started or are beginning to grow their small businesses um, and bring the best, the, the, the brightest and the best in Africa to work within small and growing businesses that wouldn't ordinarily be able to afford them using a private equity, equity model. Um, and that was fantastic because I gained the experience to 10 small and growing businesses in various industries within fast moving consumer goods, agribusiness, and a little bit of tech. Um, build amazing networks, um, raise a ton of money for these SMEs while helping them grow, um, and leverage a ton of my consulting skill set to be able to grow them. So let me you know, go into that a little bit. The most important skill set that I think most people would describe from consulting is actually your ability to communicate. Mm. It's a very underrated skill. But communication spans across a few things. It's, it, it could maybe just start with how you write an email. And I remember this from my BCG training is you can actually use the pyramid principle or the SCQ framework um, situation, complication, key question, even in an email. Um, so it starts even from the way you write an email to the way that you send out a calendar invite, believe it or not. Um, and it it then um, lives within the way you analyze and solve problems and you know, the, there's, a, there's a term that I love and I appreciate it more and more every day. And that's something called MISI, being mutually exclusive and completely exhaustive. And that really is about when you're trying to understand an issue, making sure that you understand it from all relevant angles. So it's uh, a few frameworks and a few skills. So skills like, you know, being able to take a very structured approach to solve problem solving, being able to uh, communicate for results and pairing, them, pairing that up with you're really going deep into a problem and, and analyzing it. Um, and when you have an SME that's um, struggling to, to allocate its time between uh, should I be building out my admin function or should I be following, uh, you know, uh, focusing on, on sales and business development, well, when you're an SME and you're really just fighting to, to live for the next day, well, it's a very clear priority. Um, if you think of the BCD 2 by 2 matrix, the size of the prize mm-hmm. and effort required. Well, uh, sales sits up at the top right quadrant. So um, it's it, it. I was very fortunate to be able to bring those skill set into SMEs. Yeah, and uh, I guess then to to round that up, I once I completed the the three year uh, what is called the Operate Investor uh, program, um, I then uh, saw an opportunity to join um, South Africa's leading fintech uh, payments company called Yoko. They were recruiting for a really interesting role, really looking also for for former MBB consultants. Uh, to help build out a corporate strategy and corporate development uh, function within the company. Um, and it really brought back a lot of the, you know, having joined, um, it brought back a lot of the memories back from consulting because we really went back to almost consulting and corporate strategy 101 to build out a corporate strategy to a well-funded. Um, and then now, you know, working on expanding the company, really looking at corporate development and MA and borrowing a lot from my previous role as an operating investor um, to really uh, assess the right opportunities and find the right opportunities to acquire and, you know, really assess that build or buy strategy for, for the company. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, so many things I love about what you shared there, Yusuf. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, the, the, the point about communication, pyramid principle, MISI, and the, the utilization of other frameworks and strategic problem solving, uh, a little shout out to Duke Fuqua. Love it. I, te- <laughs> I teach there at the business school. So uh, and I, I have a Duke MBA as well. Love it. Um, oh, wow. And uh, yeah, it's uh, and, and to hear your journey, not only that first step out of consulting, but then how you were able to uh, kind of use that as an additional launching pad and continue to move your career forward for for those who are already thinking Maybe I want to get into consulting and then perhaps I want to do some sort of some some type of work in finance after that. Um, any advice that you have uh, for folks that are already thinking they may want to transition into finance? I know you already spoke about networking, uh, but anything else there about how they can set themselves up for success? Yeah, so there's, there's a reason why if you look at most roles um, that involve anything uh, around corporate strategy, uh, M&A, investment banking, uh, you know, when, when you look at these job spec 
uh, they usually have two requirements, uh, formal consulting or formal investment banking, right? <laughs> Why is that? Well, it's actually um, because of the, the training that you get in, in those environments. Mm. So my advice is, you know, apart from the networks, you really need to make the most of what you're being trained to do, right? Um, so we mentioned, you know, a few of those frameworks around uh, permit principle, communicating for, communicating for results, being, uh, being MISI. But really what it comes down to is being able to apply a very structured and logical process um, when you're, a pro when you're um, trying to address a problem. Now, uh, when you think about the world of finance, it, it comes down to uh, resource allocation, right? Where should I be allocating you know, limited financial resources to be able to you know, maximize shareholder or stakeholder return? Um, sometimes it comes in the form of should we be acquiring something? Should we be, should we be merging? Um, should we be raising you know additional capital, whatever it may be? But the cap that you have on isn't necessarily focused on a single domain. So it's not necessarily just focused on digging up, you know, digging through data and, and trying to find some data. It isn't just packaging that data and presenting it in front of people. It isn't just getting buy-in from different stakeholders. It's actually all of the above. And a career in consulting and sometimes, you know, investment banking and sometimes both, those careers exercise the part of your brain that help you do all of those things. Collecting data, synthesizing it, packaging it, you know, presenting it and getting the buy-in of people. And that's a very unique skill set that uh, I guess for good or bad is only really taught and developed in consulting firms or in investment banks. Um, and because it's such a unique, unique place, because you know you're doing this, you're not just doing it for anyone. You're doing it for the biggest companies in the world, for you know the some of the most successful CEOs in the world. That's those are the people you're advising. Those are the people you're presenting to and preparing all of these presentations, which is why you know consultants have to be so meticulous and detail oriented at and you know all of that because mm -hmm. um, you're preparing these things for people who have really important jobs and have to make really important decisions. Um, it's for that reason that. Uh, uh, they, they trust that advice and it's that skill set that becomes very important to get if you want to then go into the world of finance or investing. Mm -hmm. oh, I love those recommendations. Lean into the training, really absorb it, apply it while you're uh, at one of these firms being a consultant, because that's what's going to be expected of you as you as you move on. So in addition to your current work in fintech, you are a coach with us here at Management Consulted. And as such, you help clients prepare for interviews at the world's top consulting firms. What's the process that you run your clients through to prepare? Okay, so I first like to understand the client's context, right? Mm -hmm. So what program are they applying for, um, mm -hmm. whether it's the internship um, or the, the full-time role, as well as whether they interview for perhaps a graduate mm -hmm. position or an experience role or um, an MBA consultant role. This really develops the baseline of what's going to be expected from you when you go in through, into that case interview. From there, it's then assessing where you are in terms of your case interview preparation. So here, it's understanding you know, where the client is in terms of the number of reps that they've been through. Um, so one, you know, how many cases have you been through? Uh, what have you really practices? Are these more on the qualitative or quantitative side? Um, and Really, from here, what I'm trying to understand is, do you have practice? If you do have practice, where are your weak areas? Uh, where would you like to improve on? And two, if you haven't done that many cases, well, now we're going to be building up that baseline and really mm -hmm. assessing um, what you need to be focusing on, what you're good at, um, what you what you might might be struggling with, and what you might have to improve along along the way. Parallel to that, to that, it's also uh, getting an understanding of uh, how comfortable. Uh, the client is with two things, their resume or their CV, as well as their cover letter, because both of these elements inform what happens you know, before and after the case. Um, so usually like running through the client's um, resume, uh, seeing how well they're able to communicate it in a structured way, uh, because you know, uh, speaking to your resume isn't about going through each of your positions, it's actually about telling a story. Uh, and if you're able to do that with your with your CV, you actually uh, are showing off some some good skills to the uh, to the partner that you're interviewing with. Uh, and similarly with your um, with your cover letter, and that's an experience for for someone to then double click into specific experiences, which is what I usually do as well in that in that process. But 
keep that keep that on side. Let's let's come back to the to the case interview. So once we have an, uh, a baseline understanding of where where the client is, we then um, I have a, a set of cases that I usually work through that address different things. Um, one, they're across a spectrum of difficulty, and two, uh, they're across a spectrum of qualitative and quantitative, um, both incorporating core things like being able to develop a framework. Um, or you know, understand the key facts, de uh, develop a framework, go into you know one, two, three levels of of insights and of detail when when presenting solutions um, to a case. So it's really about picking the the right case for the candidate at that level, um, and then throughout the different coaching sessions, uh, establishing what the areas for development are, incorporating that into the next case that they work on. And then along the way, doing two things, um, developing the case interview strength, um, mm. and at the same time, building up the candidate's confidence. And the reason why I incorporate this very important element of confidence into the case interview preparation process is that when you're interviewing for a consulting firm, um, one, you're being tested for your case interview skills, but two, you're also being tested that if you're taken and within a month or two put into the situation where you are now um, in a live case with a client um, and now presenting a recommendation, well, even if you have the right answer, it, it isn't necessarily about that. If you're presenting that answer with doubt and you aren't confident in your ability to communicate it to convince people, well, the client is not going to trust it, no matter how rigorous um, and robust your analysis is. So the, the interviewer really wants to see how confident are you that even if you may stumble upon pieces of data or insights here and there, how confident are you in your ability to present and how much conviction do you have in it? Um, and that's an important element that, you know, through this process, I like to, to build with, with clients. Oh, absolutely. I love how you talked through those uh, extra elements of resume review, behavioral interview prep, confidence, executive presence, these things are all part of the package of what the firms are looking for. Absolutely. Um, piggybacking off of that a little bit, in your experience, what are one or two qualities that most successful candidates possess? Yeah, so I guess coming back to, to what I mentioned, um, the, the qualities that, that candidates present is really being confident through throughout the process. Now, this mm -hmm. must not be confused for, for arrogance. It really is when you walk into that interview room or when you dial into that Zoom call, mm -hmm. um, it's having the confidence to not be overwhelmed by who the person interviewing you may be. So this might be a partner, you know, might be a well-known partner, it might be on mm -hmm. TV or, you know, whatever it might be. But it really is, um, you know, sitting up straight and, and being confident uh, smiling, usually engaging in some some chit chat, and showing that um, you're not just there to to you know show how well you can case. Uh, you're actually there to meet someone, to get to know them better, and see whether you want to work with them for for the next couple of years. Um, so that's the the one very important quality. I guess the the second very important quality is being able to solve a problem with the uh, a little bit of, of humility. Um, and the reason why I say that is there's, there's a phrase that, that we used to use at BCG when we, when we often thought about uh, recruitment. I, I support it with, with quite a few programs around recruitment. And uh, we tried to synthesize what is the character or the person that we're looking for. And uh, we came down to uh, humble overachievers. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for whatever connotation it may have, um, it really did come down to that. You know, is this person smart and confident and able to do that? But are they able to do that in a, in a humble way? And probably one of the best ways to show that humility is saying, "Hey, you know, this is the the, the recommendation I have, but um, subject to you know validation of some more mm -hmm. inputs or you know communication or socializing, whatever these recommendations are." With, um, the rest of the client side, or maybe even, you know, passing this up to some expert at BCG and getting their, their you know, expert input into this. Um, that's that's also a, a very key character that, that people um, or that consultants look for. Uh, and sometimes it's also even the small things like, um, you know, if, you, if you're walking into to a room, 
uh, and you see the partner on a call just you know knocking on the door and you know giving him that minute to, to take his call before walking in. If if he receives a call saying, "Hey, if you need to take a minute, take your call," um, it's it's showing that uh, you know you're not just worried about yourself and your own interview. If something else comes up, mm. you you're willing to be accommodated. Mm. Humble, considerate, overachiever. I really like that. I'm going to use that classification moving forward. Um, Yusuf, we really appreciate you taking the time to share more about yourself, your journey, what you do here at MC. How can people work with you? Yeah, so the best and the easiest way is to reach out um, via the management consultant platform. So mm -hmm. uh, when you're ready to get started with, with training, uh, feel free to book a session with me uh, on the platform. I'm usually available uh, Wednesdays and Sundays, depending on where you are in the world. For me in South Africa, it's uh, usually in the afternoons and evenings. So you, know, you can reach out to me directly via, via the platform. Perfect. Yusuf, thanks again for your time. Thanks so much, uh, Stephanie, and have a great day further. Welcome to After Office Hours, the part of the show where we take and answer your questions. Don't forget to send in your question. You can record a quick 30 to 60 second voice note on your phone and email it to podcast at managementconsulted.com. We're very excited for this. Today's question comes from Dylan in New Jersey. And to answer it is Naman, our COO. Naman, how you doing? Fantastic. I'm ready to see if Dylan can stump us today. Well, here is the question. Hi, my name is Dylan Mohan. I'm currently located in New Jersey. And my question is, I've been searching for open positions on some of the bigger firms' websites, and I can't find just a general management consulting job. I was wondering if you could break down some of these subdivisions, such as human capital, technology, deals advisory, uh, and snowballing off that, are there some smaller firms that that do offer just a general management consulting job where you're exposed to a lot of different functions working for your clients? Thank you. Dylan, that's a great question. The world of consulting can be a black box, especially if you're relying on firm websites to give you all the information that you need. Uh, they are notoriously clunky, uh, confusing, uh, and not messy, surprisingly, considering that's the way that you should approach a consulting project. Let's see if we can bring some clarity to your job search. So number one, there are firms out there that offer generalist roles. This means that you are working on projects across industries for different types of clients, solving different types of business problems. Most of the larger firms that you've been looking for jobs at actually offer generalist roles. So MBB, Big Four, firms like Accenture Strategy, LEK, Oliver Wyman, all of these firms and more offer generalist roles. Now, as you've alluded to, there are also consulting firms, some of the same consulting firms I just mentioned, that also offer industry-specific or function-specific roles as well. So you're right, human capital practice areas that deal a lot with compensation and benefits packages, change management, post-merger integration specifically when it comes to teams and people, supply chain functions that of course deal with supply chain and procurement, technology practice areas that deal either with technology strategy, aka what type of technology will help us solve this problem, or technology implementation, actually being embedded in the client organization, helping them roll out a particular solution. How do you figure out what type of consulting is right for you? Number one, network. Talk to people inside of the specific firms and practice areas that you're interested in potentially joining. Ask them personal, specific, and positive questions. What do I mean by that? Don't ask them questions about the firm or life on the job that you can figure out by reading our website or the firm websites. Ask them specifically about what their day-to-day -day on the job looks like about the projects that they've been staffed on, about the number of industries that they've been able to serve in the last X years that they've been working at the firm. So number one, make sure to network. Number two, leverage our consulting firm directory and our consulting firm profiles to get an insider look at the firms. We break down the differing levels of compensation that each practice area and firm offers. So make sure you take advantage of those free resources at Management Consultant. Dylan, let me leave you with this. The best way to identify open generalist roles at the firms that you're targeting is not through searching online. It's through networking. 
here's what you want to do. You want to target people in the role that you're applying for inside of your target offices and speak to them. We have incredible resources on identifying the right people to talk to and how to reach out to them. We've included them in the show notes. But if you blindly apply online, you can expect to be dazed, confused, and frustrated. And even when you do apply for an open role, the chances are low that you'll receive a response just through applying online. So in the discovery process and the pre-application process, you wanna make sure that you're networking to identify open roles inside of your target practice areas and offices, and to ensure that when you do apply, your application is flagged for further review. Best of luck, and don't hesitate to follow up with further questions. Thanks, Naman, and thanks, Dylan, for submitting that question. Um, Well, there you have it, folks. Remember, you can send in your own questions to our email. That's podcast at managementconsultant.com. We'll catch you next week for another question. Want to work directly with Yusuf? Check out his coaching calendar in the link below. All of our coaches are ex McKinsey, Bain, or BCG consultants and interviewers who've been extensively vetted and only coach with us here at Management Consulted. They love working with prospective candidates to mock through full interviews or drill in areas you need extra help. You can find a link in the show notes or read more about our offerings at managementconsulted.com.